start. Um, let's talk today about uh, the most important thing uh, in the world, about uh, life and biodiversity, and particularly about biodiversity around tea. Biodiversity, it's uh, all uh, life on Earth. Uh, all the variety of uh, ecosystems, it's uh, numbers in thousands uh, different ecosystems, and uh, from ocean, uh, rainforest, deserts, and even cities. And also varieties of uh, species and uh, different genes, uh, the gene pool and uh, the uh, genetic diversity of uh, the same species, uh, same different populations. And that's all uh, we call biodiversity. And uh, biodiversity, it's uh, uh, very important for us, for our survival, uh, because we depend uh, with our uh, food source and uh, the, what, the quality of water we drink and uh, the air we uh, breathing uh, on uh, biodiversity. What is the healthy ecosystem? Uh, one example, uh, the mangrove forest. That's uh, the forest living uh, around uh, coast uh, and uh, the, all the plants, all the community uh, of um, life here, uh, semi-flooded with the uh, tide. And uh, this is very important for the uh, environment and the different uh, groups of organisms. It's nursery for uh, different uh, species of fishes. They, they come from the sea, hiding in these roots and uh, protecting the shore from the uh, big waves and uh, wind from the weather conditions. So, and uh, the ecosystem is quite fragile because it's uh, small. It's uh, existing only uh, along the shoreline. Also, um, very uh, small changes can bring the very big impact. So this picture uh, uh, show how the erosion uh, going on uh, on the slopes of uh, deforested mountains in China, in Yunnan province. And also the now we are doing the biggest impact as a, a human population on all biodiversity on the planet. But that's work in both ways. Uh, the small changes can bring a, a bigger impact and uh, uh, everything for good bring uh, better for uh, environment and uh, uh, our life and life of all the organisms around. The uh, biggest part of biodiversity uh, is insects and uh, I am uh, Entomologists working with the taxonomy, with systematic insects and biodiversity of uh, one group of insects. Uh, I didn't uh, introduce myself. My name is Alexey Reshkov, and I'm working in uh, Delhi University. Uh, the biggest group of uh, insects are parasitoids. That's ecological groups. Means uh, this is example of uh, Xaridas wasp that uh, are looking for the larvae of uh, uh, Xylophagus beetles inside of uh, wood and you can see the ovipositor uh, it's lion eggs uh, throw the wood in uh, on the larvae of the beetle 
paralyzing is temporary. Uh, uh, let's uh, defer uh, parasitoids from the real parasites. That's very bad bugs, uh, the bad guys, uh, parasites of humans. But uh, no one uh, was killed by this uh, species, but uh, uh, these animals, uh, parasitoids, uh, temporarily uh, paralyzed uh, victims uh, at, at the end they consume uh, the whole body. But uh, parasites using the host as a source of food or environment. And uh, they differ from the real predators that immediately kill the uh, prey. So, Vasilina, how to, to, how to uh, use this to come back? For one, two. Yeah, please. And run run the video, please. So I want to show you how beautiful uh, our uh, wasp that uh, I work with. This is Cryptus purpuratus from Thailand. Beautiful, is it? And this is female. You can recognize it by the uh, ovipositor extended from the abdomen uh, looking for for the prey for the food of source for uh, the offsprings so this is a typical uh, behavior of uh, these wasps they never stay uh, very uh, difficult to spot and they, they are uh, also so numerous. Uh, this is the most diverse group of insects. They connected with uh, uh, many groups of different insects uh, using uh, very different strategies, uh, ecological strategies, and uh, utilizing very different groups and uh, stages. Uh, one example, for example, this agri uh, typus, it's diving in the water looking for the caddis of the uh, trichoptera, the caddis flies, or uh, spider parasitoids. So, uh, it's very broad varieties of biology. They uh, they everywhere, and that's why they uh, so diverse. Uh, the speciation uh, went very uh, intensively, and they also very important for us for humans. They can be used as a, a biocontrol agents. And this example of uh, Lateralestis sopsini uh, that successfully was used in the United States uh, against the uh, pest of birch. This red is the huge areas of birch forests in Alaska uh, because of the uh, the sawfly, Profinus uh, the uh, insect that occasionally uh, uh, was brought to America from Europe, uh, from where it is normal insects and uh, bring no harm to birds. And uh, in America, it started to be very aggressive. And uh, uh, huge areas of uh, birch forest uh, were defoliated. And the guys from uh, Massachusetts University uh, reproduced this, they, they found it and I described it as a new species uh, and uh, 
they reproduce the uh, numbers of individuals and release in nature. And uh, it uh, uh, decreases the impact uh, on the birch from the profilusa. And uh, yes, the, the working. This is a video uh, showing how the larvae of this uh, sawfly living inside of the uh, leaf plate. The larvae quite tiny and uh, living inside of the leaf, eating it from uh, from inside, doing the uh, the mines. Uh, the area that they uh, ate, we called mines. So they ate a bunch of leaves and then suddenly all the trees? Yes. Um, and the uh, black dots, it's a. Uh, uh, Defecation from the lab. So pretty quickly. And also, uh, we can use uh, my wasps for uh, indications as a biodiversity indicators uh, to understand how uh, diverse is nature in different places. And uh, what we can uh, do for uh, different programs, uh, saving uh, the forest and uh, the conservation programs. So what actually I'm doing uh, uh, in my lab uh, is I'm. Um, I'm questioning how the uh, nature structures in a three-dimensional uh, world, how uh, different groups of insects living together and uh, what is the trends. Uh, and mountains can uh, answer these questions. If we uh, will check the different communities of uh, insects, particularly uh, Ichnimon was from the bottom, uh, from the valley uh, to the top of the mountain. We can see uh, how different they are and uh, could extrapolate uh, uh, further uh, because uh, we know about some uh, hosts and how uh, they connected to other insects and uh, plants, the host plants. So, and also we can stretch. Uh, this research from north to south, understanding how uh, the temperate fauna connected to the tropical fauna here in Asia. So generally, the idea is to understand how uh, nature uh, structured in 3D. How to realize this? Uh, this guy is René Malé. Uh, he was a Swedish entomologist working with the soulflies, uh, that's vegetarian wasps, in Stockholm, yeah, Natural History Museum, and uh, he uh, traveled to Myanmar, uh, that time uh, Burma, uh, in a northern place on the border with China, and the place Kambaiti, together with his wife, uh, in their private expedition. And uh, they uh, collect insects there and brought to Sweden uh, a lot of uh, specimens for scientific research. And they used the different methods. Uh, sweep netting, uh, uh, hand picking, even trading with children for candies. And uh, sitting 
in the tent or in his heater and they realize the, um, the phenomena uh, of negative heliotaxis. And this Harlequin ladybird can explain you uh, how it works. The insects, if you remember the fly that uh, you got in your kitchen, it's land on the uh, window glass and always climb up. Uh, they need this for orientation to take off. Oh, you can see uh, with this ladybird, it always needs to climb uh, on the top of and uh, on the tip of the leaf to take off. Otherwise, it can be lost. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Rene realized that uh, we can make the tent like a structure and uh, put on top the collector for collecting insects. And uh, uh, nowadays, it's the uh, most efficient uh, method uh, for uh, working with the biodiversity of terrestrial ecosystems. So we can understand uh, uh, without almost without bi biases, uh, the fauna compositions. Uh, you don't need to wake up early to take the, to grab the nets, or maybe you, uh, the evening person, you come to uh, collect the, the light, the different insects. It's always standing in nature and collecting spot and collecting independently. You just need to come twice uh, a month uh, and change the collector. So this is the modern uh, type we use. Uh, and we use it uh, in Yunnan province where I'm working and Delhi University and uh, in northern Thailand. And uh, this is the area of uh, the tea origin. Uh, I explained a little bit why tea. Uh, several years ago, I came, uh, I moved from Sweden to uh, Asia, and uh, I was looking for the uh, possibilities to do this research that I always wanted to do. And uh, uh, it's problematic nowadays with uh, uh, obtaining the funds and grants. And uh, I got an idea uh, using uh, citizen science. If any of the uh, normal people, not researchers, can uh, take part and help uh, in the project, and uh, I came to tea. The tea farmers mm -hmm. are always uh, in nature. So they, they come in for picking. They uh, most of the time they live in not far from the areas they pick in tea. And uh, that's pretty good uh, source of insects for long-term uh, projects uh, like mine. Mm -hmm. Add some delay. About the tea, uh, you saw the area. This is the um, eastern ranges of Himalaya. The uh, origin of the Camellia uh, sinensis. That's a uh, Latin scientific name for tea plant uh, we used for making tea. But uh, they are uh, not just one species. There is... Mm -hmm. uh, there is um, the subspecies that called Camellia sinensis sanica growing in uh, uh, Himalaya slopes in uh, Assam uh, in eastern and northern eastern India and uh, here in Thailand, northern Thailand in Yunnan. Oh, and you can see the Trees could grow quite huge. It's a big trees, and um, the 
in other subspecies is Camellia sinensis sinensis that uh, derives from uh, Camellia sinensis asamica some thousands uh, yeah, years ago, probably uh, somewhere in South China. And uh, it's yeah, usually bushes and uh, uh, the leaves quite smaller in compared with the Asamica variety. And uh, there are also many different species existing uh, in, in the region. That uh, also might be useful. Uh, they are in use for uh, tea production. And uh, another uh, thing that make the picture difficult, uh, all these subspecies that uh, they uh, are able for uh, making hybrids. Uh, there are many hybrids between them. Ah, that was uh, another subspecies from Hong Kong. And this uh, Camellia italiensis, um, by the name of Dali, where I stay in China, uh, living in uh, south uh, western and uh, western Yunnan and uh, uh, the slopes of these mountains in Myanmar, uh, Camellia italiensis, also in use for poor production and uh, white tea in China. And Camellia irabadiensis, it's uh, another species on uh, Irrawaddy uh, tributary uh, in Myanmar and the Shan state of uh, Myanmar. Thank you. So, um, for um, uh, making the search for uh, a long time and uh, a, in different uh, places, uh, I came across uh, the tree producers, and uh, uh, that was fortunate. And I met uh, uh, the owner of the Mansoon Tea uh, Company. This is Thai company, and uh, Ryan will explain you later afterwards uh, about. Uh, we immediately uh, jumped in the jeep and uh, came to the tea places in the forest. Uh, Mansoon tea, uh, working with farmers, uh, picking from uh, forest-friendly environments. Is it? Uh, or it's uh, wild growing tea uh, trees or uh, natural gardens and in past were, uh, were in use for uh, edible tea production. The local tribes, I would pass this uh, story for Rain, right? Uh, and uh, we uh, set a different plots here in Northern Thailand mm. and start a tea founder project uh, collecting uh, data about biodiversity from the tea places. To understand how the tea ecosystem uh, working, how it's structured. We know just one species uh, or subspecies, Camellia sinensis, and uh, what else? There is a list of uh, pests of tea, mostly from the uh, big uh, plantations, uh, monocrop plantations, where it's occurred, but uh, we know very little about how tea living in nature. And to describe, of course, the new species, uh, uh, my group is uh, quite unknown. Uh, only it's estimated that we know about one uh, third of the uh, diversity of this group. Uh, this is uh, so let's say the ebb uh, described uh, for uh, Rene Malé's wife, Ebba Malé from Northern Thailand, the tea places. 
and uh, Pastil Gnusaki from uh, EU9, recently described as new species. And uh, uh, we can also understand uh, using the data uh, obtaining from the project how to improve monocrop agriculture and how uh, this uh, ecosystem quite poor, but still how can uh, uh, this uh, environment uh, serve as a refugee for uh, different species? Uh, at least this is a, a bush, then something can hide in. It's not slashed uh, culture uh, like some others uh, that completely clear after the harvest. But uh, to understand how to use this uh, or how to improve it, we uh, need to understand how nature are living inside of this. And to save the forest, uh, to run the programs that uh, can uh, allow us to protect uh, with the tea businesses, uh, natural environments. So I just want to show you how beautiful are uh, different insects uh, you can see on tea. And at the end, it's just a short movie from the northern Thailand, from the forest where uh, Manson tea uh, buying the uh, source for the teas you can try today after the event. This is how all type of the malaise strap working. Thank you. Are there any questions? Would your main goal of your project have to be moved from Sweden? Is to understand the biodiversity specifically around the box in the forest among the tea. Is that right? Uh, the whole project is about uh, biodiversity of the group and uh, uh, to get the group as a tool uh, to understand the uh, diverse, biodiversity of insects in general uh, because this group these wasps they connected to everything in the insect world and the tea is uh, just part of uh, the bigger scale project uh, just one of the piece of the puzzle because um, uh, we are collecting data from the mountains, even without uh, IT growing there. But uh, as, as the region is the uh, origin of uh, tea species, uh, different species of tea. Uh, of course, uh, it's, it's uh, some places they are tea fauna. I'm going to check if uh, any question from online audience.
Nope. Then if no questions, I could pass the uh, word for Ryan. Uh, just one click, one tap, okay. and then one slide. Uh, on. All right. So my name is Ryan, and I work with Monsoon Tea Company. We're a Thai company based out of Chiang Mai, Thailand. And as Alexi said, we're working with Alexi um, to help in his project with identifying the insects up in specifically northern Thailand now. Um, but maybe we can expand as things go on. Uh, and then this, I'm going to talk about um, what we do at Monsoon Tea and how we work in, with tea growing together with the forest. So, do you guys know what this is? Uh, maybe not down here on the islands, it's definitely not here, but it's something that origins in the same place that tea origins, uh, the same place that these wasp and Alexi is talking about origins. Uh, this is Miang. So Miang is like, is tea leaves actually it's like a it's the leaves off the tea plant that you pack together and ferment and people for many many years before drinking tea were eating and sucking the juices you could swallow it and it's really healthy for you and still sometimes used today so before i talk about tea let's start with what tea looks like today so as many of you know like we have all these beautiful areas uh, in places like China that have these huge plantations. And this is great because tea is the second most consumed drink in the world and we, we need all this production to meet our demand. We love to drink it morning, afternoon, and night. It's fantastic. So this is what that looks like. And the tea plant that's used for that is the Camellia sinensis domesticated plant. Um, now one of the issues that happens as, as a result of these plantations sometimes is the deforestation. You know, to, to grow all these beautiful plantations, we do need to take away the forest. And that does present a problem if you're really thinking about the whole environment in the world. Uh, we do need the biodiversity. Uh, we need biodiversity in the mountains. We need to keep the trees alive and ideally have step away from monoculture plantations. I think it's still okay to have a biodiversity of like the tea, but together with other species and other forests. Uh, some other problems that come up is as you take away all the forests and the life underneath and you use more domesticated species, sometimes it needs extra gifts of the fertilizer to help push it to keep growing leaves. It needs the pesticides because it's perhaps not strong enough on its own to prevent the insects. And then you need these irrigation systems set up. So we start to pull away water from our reservoirs and other systems around. Um, but what if, what is, is there a way that we can grow tea naturally? Uh, more in the natural state where it's, it's the plant growing in the forest, but along with other species in there, like perhaps even other crops like coffee, cacao, stuff like that, that together they work together and they can grow in the forest where we have this biodiversity for the natural environment too. And one way to do it is just take what's already working. So as Alexi showed you before, there's tea growing in these mountains in northern Thailand. Uh, and some of the tea, if it's grown long enough, can become a tree. Uh, it's, these are trees that are growing up in the mountains and they have tea among them. So there is ways to utilize this natural growing plant in the forest. And that's what we're trying to do with monsoon tea. So right here is a picture that 
also talks about the Himalayan tail, you know, the mountains off of the Himalayas, beginning in Assam, India, down through Burma, Laos, northern Thailand, and of course, southern China, but also northern Vietnam. Uh, and another name for this is Zomia. And this region of the world is really special. Uh, one, of the, one of the species that is from here is the tea plant species. So the tea plant does originate in this area of the world. Uh, also, rice originates here. Different citruses originate here. There's a lot of beautiful, really high demand used um, things in the world that come from this area of the world. And we're focusing on tea right now. And this is going back to the tea going in the forest. So like I showed you before, the mian, this is the production of what the mian looks like. So you saw the trees before, but now here's more of like a very overgrown bush, perhaps a, a small tree of the tea growing in the forest. And what people have done for many generations before we even drank tea like we do today, they would pick the leaves off of the plant and as you can see, they're very big leaves. Uh, these days, we only use the small, youngest buds to drink tea because that has that proper, clean taste, not so bitter, that we can produce a very nice, delicious tea drink from. But these ones are used in a different way. And these, we get to use the leaves off the whole tree, off the whole bush. And you can pack them together in the second pitcher really tight and drop them in a bucket as simple as a bucket of water. And over time, it starts to ferment because after you break the leaf off, the chemical reactions begin to occur. And so once when that chemical reaction recurs after breaking the leaf off, that's when it starts to ferment when you put it in the water where it's packed tight and everything starts to press with each other. And the result is mia. And I wish I had it for you today, but uh, we do have it up in Bangkok and Chiang Mai for you to try. And they have it in markets too, all around. You have to just kind of look for it. this ugly looking, strong green color <laughs> and you'll find it. But it's fun to try and it's said to have a lot of beautiful natural bacteria in it. You know, some people are talking more and more about kombucha. How is it used? So just for chewing? Yeah, just for chewing. So still today, when we go in the mountains with our farmers, uh, the, the people who are helping out, whether picking or not, they'll be chewing on it all day. And you, like we know about tea, it has the caffeine. So this has a form of like energizing chemical compounds in it as well. So they'll chew it. Reminds me of chewing tobacco actually. So you just put it in your mouth and you suck on it, take out the juices, uh, and you can swallow it like chewing tobacco or you can spit it out and just put more in, uh, so whatever you feel comfortable with. It's a very like strong, umami, like a little sour taste. The sour is more from the fermentation part. And then the like that strong, like it's like a bitter umami taste that's coming from that plant. That's a really, it really will punch you in the head. Like, you know, it be a good energy for sure. So do you think that uh, it's possible to find some uh, where So you can uh, try Ruby salad. If they say it's called in uh, yeah. So try the pet. And then to come together in the, in the dish. But we have a salad. Yes, yeah, the, uh, the dark green yeah, yeah, yeah. in the Burmese salad, the tea leaf salad. It's that dark green part mm -hmm. of the salad. Yeah, so you can find it in restaurants serving that salad. But in terms of growing, I don't believe it should grow here on the island. Uh, it's more focused up in the region, like we talked about. Northern Thailand, China, India, stuff like that. Well, yeah, they, the Burmese still have it in the famous Burmese tea leaf salad that you can find. Yeah. You can find it, you must also find it like this in Pangan or in Chiang Mai. I think, I don't think it's in Pangan, yeah, because it's the same, it's a tea plant. So, you know, wherever the tea plant can grow, that's typically in the mountains. You know, the tea plant can grow in Chiang Mai, yeah, right. So these pictures are up in Chiang Mai. These are up in Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, all the northern Thailand provinces. This is growing. And then through Yunnan, China, northern Burma, northern Vietnam, all those places in that region coming off of the bottom of the Himalayas. It's pretty cool.
And this is, so over time, you know, people started to consume this in the mountains and they tried to make a business of it. So they would start to find the tea growing in the mountains, maybe start to plant some more of the seeds and they would create a Miang plantation. So the Miang plantation, as you can see, you, you only see green in these pictures. It's still really keeping the natural biodiversity of the forest. And that's what's so beautiful that it can grow naturally. It doesn't need the extra water or any special uh, chemicals for the pesticides and fertilizer. It's strong by itself. It's from these mountains. And that's what's so special about it. Um, but the, the unfortunate part about this industry is that the Miang isn't really a good product. And, and the way the world works sometimes is it, it helps to have something that you can put value onto the forest. And the Miang industry was not so strong. It's not very appealing. It looks kind of gross, actually. <laughs> this dark green thing, it's, it's really difficult to maintain. Uh, so over time, the, the, the landowners and the people working in these mountains, they have to provide for the family. You know, the community needs work. They need, they need some value on these mountains to survive and thrive in their communities. So, you know, like anyone, they start to talk to other companies about perhaps making corn in the mountains, making pineapple, orange trees, all these big products that also have high demand. And the large companies can help to produce these in the mountains. Uh, but the side effect, the result of this, is you, you produce more deforestation. Uh, even with the tea plantations, if it does work into tea, you start to cut down the forest first to restart the, the land, and then you start to plant in mass production the corn or the orange, uh, the apple trees, anything like that. Uh, but like I said, you know, this, this isn't a naturally beautiful environment. It's kind of right here, you can see which one looks more beautiful, feels more right for the mountains, and then ultimately for us as well, because all these mountains and forests feed us the oxygen that we need. So this is a way to, to work together with the forest and bring value back to the forest using the same natural tea plant that produces that meow. This is tea. So this is the way monsoon tries to grow what we call forest-friendly tea in the mountains. As you can see in this picture, it's nothing but the beautiful green colors, the trees, the soil, the leaves around it. And that's because we're not using all the pesticides and fertilizer. We're trying to grow tea together with the forest. And you know, to, to make it a commercial product, you do need to come into the forest, work together with it, where you do take a little bit away to walk around and have some of the, the plants growing there. But in general, it's working together with the forest. And that's our idea, is that the more tea we can produce and sell ultimately to consumers around the world is the more forest we can keep like this, opposed to producing a deforested land that starts to kill all the natural biodiversity. And the benefit, like I said, is you keep the beautiful insects and biodiversity that Alexei and his team is trying to research more and more about and the value that those bring to the forest and the value that they work together in the ecosystem. And you can see here how a reason why they can survive is these tea plants have very deep roots. And these deep roots stay into the soil for a very long time and they start to work together in the environment over time, which allows them to have the strength to survive even when there's fires in, in the mountains or if people are trying to come in and destruct the forest, they'll stay alive because of their root system. And which one looks nicer to you guys? <laughs> so the, what we're trying to do is do more of the forest. From the high level view, you can still see the forest, the trees are there, the natural biodiversity is within these mountains. Or we can have the conventional tea where it does produce the very delicious, high quality tea taste we're all used to. But if we can find a way to, to put this tea back into the forest and still produce that type of tea, then we all work out in a better way. And this is how we start to illustrate the biodiversity grown in, in these mountains. Uh, Lexi just pr presented quite a bit about their biodiversity and all the research that people like him are doing in these mountains for many years. They're going in there, they're really seeing and studying what is growing in there, what is 
biodiversity even consider? What, what defines biodiversity? And so what we're trying to do with our forest friendly tea is and with partnership with Alexi and his team and the Tea Fauna project is to really define biodiversity. And so that now when we start to make this product, the tea grown in the mountains, people know that they're growing tea with a certain level of biodiversity around it. They're supporting the forest with the way that they're producing this tea. Oh, sorry. And so going towards more of the commercial side, because we, it's okay. So to, to make this, to protect the forest ultimately, we need to sell more tea. And by selling more tea, that allows us the purchasing power to put value back on keeping the forest. And that's where the company side comes into it. You know, we need to, to put a brand on this, to sell this in the shops online so that people can, uh, can consume this in mass proportion because the more tea we can produce, the more forest we ultimately can protect. And like we said at the beginning of the presentation, Monsoon Tea is a Thai company. We're based up in Chiang Mai, Thailand, where this tea is grown, part of that whole region that has this natural biodiversity. And we're trying to market it in these earth tone ways and really keep it a down to earth brand. We, we don't want to make it too flashy. We want, it, we want to keep it together with the forest theme, you know, just understanding that we're all together on this to consume the tea, enjoy it every day, and then protect the forest while doing it. Some ways we have shops already in Thailand. We have our wholesale where we sell at cafes, hotels, restaurants. We have, of course, online nowadays. And then we also started doing tea tourism this year. So specifically up in Northern Thailand, we now have at least three locations that we can bring people um, to the mountains and start to see the way the tea is growing in the forest. If you're lucky enough, maybe Alexi's there. He can show you more about the insects, uh, as well as like you can learn to produce tea in a simple way, depending on how much you really want to learn. This is the feel of our brand where we, again, we try to keep it fun. You know, there's a lot of amazing tea producers in the world out of China, you know, out of the East Asia region. There's a lot of amazing tea producers that have all these brilliant oolongs, green teas, ultimately a pu'er type teas. And we're not trying to copy that. We recognize that everyone makes amazing tea. What we're doing at first with monsoon tea is making tea that grows together with the forest that we can serve in pure tea form to drink like that, or we can flavor it. We can add a type of natural flavoring to it in a minimal scale so that the tea still captures the natural forest tea flavor. That's what we're trying to do in Monsoon. Make this large portfolio of teas that anyone who wants mango with their tea, rose flower, or simply a pure natural tea can consume. Here's a snapshot of what our shops look like today. All of them are in Thailand right now. We have shops in Bangkok, in Chiang Mai, and here's a shot of some of our biggest wholesale customers. Uh, we have many now uh, wonderful restaurants in Thailand. Um, some of them are Michelin star rated, are really good restaurants are trying to do interesting things with our tea, doing tea pairing, making kombucha, doing all these natural things you can do with a natural organic product. We also have many customers abroad who are starting to gain attention of this way of doing it because people around the world who are looking forward to sustainable ways of doing business, we're presenting our tea to because that's what we try to do with our business is make a sustainable way of doing business with the forest, with you guys, with us, with everyone involved in the cycle. This is what our tourism looks like. We can do things as simple as doing a tea tasting like we're gonna do today. Uh, so you can taste the tea, you can experience the tea in that way. You can start to learn about it a little more or on the larger scale, you can go up into the mountains. And that's definitely the most fun, where you can go in the mountains, we can walk around, walk around among the tea, learn how to produce it in a simple way, as well as just feeling what it's like to be in the mountains. Because one of the coolest things that I've learned while working with Monsoon is the feeling when you're in the mountains and the people you're around, because we're so used to nowadays, you know, sitting in the cafe and having our coffee or the tea in our cup but we don't think too much about 
that special feeling that comes up in the mountains where these people have to pick it at six in the morning and they have to like hike up in the mountains, especially with RT. They also have all the bushes around and the leaves that they have to walk through. It's a difficult process and we're trying to bring back that human touch. And this is kind of the simple way we do it. Nice, the hot tea or the flavored tea way. And this goes back to the cycle, the life cycle we're trying to do as a business. We're trying to keep in mind the farmers and their communities because these farmers are the, truly the protectors of the forest. They're the ones who are up in the mountains every day. They're the ones who are waking up, picking the, they have the team picking the tea, then bringing the tea quickly to the factory to produce it, keeping the mountains and, and being responsible to protect the forest. What we're trying to do with our company is give them the, the proper tools and the money, the value to, to do this type of project because they need to support their community too. And if it means that they're producing corn on a mass scale, hey, they need to do what's best for their families and their communities. What we're trying to do is provide a sustainable substitute for producing those mass consumed monoculture products. We're trying to bring other products like the coffee, tea, cacao, avocado that everyone appreciates and grow it together with the forest. And this is some of the stuff we've, over time, we've been blessed to work with a lot of really interesting people around the world and in Thailand, whether it's with the United Nations, different professors around the world, different people who are historians, researchers, tea producers, many different people. I think we all share the common interest of wanting a sustainable way of doing business. So thank you very much. And then if you guys have any questions, I'd love to talk more or we can go into doing the tea tasting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think nobody, we can just do the tea tasting. You told me that, uh, you told that uh, you um, try not to copy the teas of other regions. Yeah. But uh, I just checked the website, but uh, yeah. there's white tea, green tea. Uh, is yeah. it also comes from the Chiang Mai or you just protect the uh, products of other regions? Yeah, no, all of our tea is from Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai at this moment. And what I mean by not copying is that there's certain regions of the world that I think some of you know well that, that produce a certain type of oolong tea, for example. And yeah. everyone knows that the taste of that tea, the brilliance of the flavor of that tea, we're not trying to copy the flavors of other well-known teas. We're going to do green tea, black tea, oolong in our own way, but not... It's not much of a different production type. It's more we're just using different leaves. And we're not trying to produce it where it tastes like those amazing other teas coming out of China. We're just giving you the natural taste of this tea. That's what we mean. Yeah. yeah. So now you're ready to taste some of it? <laughs> Let's give it a try. So what I did is I brought four pure teas and then four flavor teas. So you can taste both styles. And then, unfortunately, I only had eight cups that I could bring. So I just try to make it as simple as possible. White tea, a green tea, oolong, and black, and then flavored of the same type of tea. Let me see if anyone else wants to do the tasting as well. So if any of you guys want to do a tea tasting, we're tasting some tea back here. If you want to try some? Yeah. 